Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Lombardo. Michael acted as a teaching assistant for my computer architecture course, which is the first time I met him. We had some interesting conversations throughout the semester. He's going to be teaching my data structures course next semester as well as a sessional lecture. Uh, Michael received his Bachelor of Computer Science, um, it, sorry, Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science with a data science specialization from Ontario Tech University in 2019 and has continued to receive his Master's of Science in Computer Science also at Ontario Tech. He specialized on the application of computer vision in various fields, including bioinformatics. Michael has been in research since 2017. Since 2018, he's been working under the supervision of Dr. Faisal Qureshi to develop a video summarization tool using PyTorch and to conduct research on biological diagram comprehension. Michael has been granted a plethora of honors throughout his research career, including three Ontario Tech University undergraduate student research fellowships, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada undergraduate research, student research award, and the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, to name a few. I'm thrilled to get to speak to Michael today to learn more about the fascinating field of computer vision. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, it's a it's a great honor to uh, you know be especially one of your first guests as someone who's been through Ontario Tech uh, all the way from my beginning of my degree to which is soon to be the end. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be nice for you also being a, a you know younger in your degree and uh, getting kind of a, a first taste at uh, you know what your future might hold. Exactly, for sure. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know, um, we both actually, I don't know if I've actually had anyone from Ontario Tech yet on the podcast. Um, so we both go to Ontario Tech. Um, it's in Oshawa. Um, I actually haven't been there because of COVID, but that's totally fine. <laughs> um, so why soon, don't we start soon enough, off? soon enough. Sorry, sorry. Soon enough. For sure. Don't worry. For sure. So in terms of um, the way that I typically do this, as everyone knows, I'll start off with some broad research questions. Um, so let's start there. Um, what got you into research? What got you interested about research? Uh, back when I was in uh, third year of my bachelor's degree, I've I've always tried to be, um, you know, high pace. I always like to be, you know, stimulated throughout throughout my like working life. Um, you know, I like to have jobs. I like to be busy, and I'm kind of fast paced with that. I always had sports growing up. I worked part time jobs, handling hockey and part-time and then doing high school so when I transferred into the university culture it was really different for me because I wasn't working as much and I was just kind of like well I only have my full-time studies I kind of wanted to you know dip my feet into new things and I think that working in research is something you know you get a project that isn't just a final project for a course right you do a final project for a course and you just you don't feel proud you know you just sort of like well I did it because I needed the grade um, so that's why I first applied for research fellowships, so the NSERCs that I've received. And uh, I really just wanted to do something that was big. And especially when you're looking, even if you don't like academia and you want to go into the industry, having these uh, fellowships with uh, our lovely supervisors can really help you to have something fortified when you're applying for jobs to say, well, I have you know all these course projects, I did this and this, but... I spent a full year or I spent a full summer working with this supervisor on this research project. Here's the code base. This is what I did. This is what I learned. And it's typically something that you haven't done in university, which I thought was very rewarding. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like it's a very unique experience in research. It's not something that, it's not something that you get in any really other job that, that sort of, um, that sort of, sense of, I guess, cre creation to some extent or mm -hmm. discovery. Um, it, it's almost unheard of in other careers, right? I mean, to, to some extent, I would say. Yeah, you're, you know, you're totally right. And uh, besides the industry, looking typically at academia, you know, you everyone, t um, courses do change a bit as, you know, computer science evolves, but there is sort of a roadmap that you go through. You know, you learn your basics, you get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty, and then you have some of your more specialized courses at the end of your education. Research kind of, again, gives you that new avenue of, you know, getting out of your comfort zone, not just doing something for an assignment, but really trying to make something rock solid. But, you know, you don't, you get into it, you don't really know what you're doing, right? You know, you might have some of the prerequisites, but often you're doing something that's out of your comfort zone. And I find that, 
you know, the fun part of research that you know, I don't know what the solution is, but I'm going to go and find what it is. I also find it, I don't know if, if this is a common thing, but I know at least when I, um, I'm currently going through the publication process for my first paper and um, that, that was episode one for anyone who was listening or who's, you know, cares to look. Um, but uh, basically it's interesting because when it was done, like, you know, you're working on it like tirelessly. I was pulling, you know, 17 hour days and it was like, it was insane. And then you get it published and I think it was about a week after where I realized this is new. Like you can't open up a textbook and find this, right? You can't Google this. This doesn't exist, right? We made this exist, right? And it's it's this sort of weird, it's this weird feeling because you're learning without having anything to learn from, right? If that makes any sense. Like you're you're learning on your own to some degree. Yeah, it really does make you stand out when it comes to, you know, kind of just even talking about yourself, you know, um, in your first episode, you guys, you know, were able to, you know, sound like the expert, right? When you read a textbook, when you're in a lecture, you're not the expert, you know, you're becoming the expert, you're learning all of these little details. That's why, like, lecturers and professors are so important, because they give you that nice little like a little taste of how they like to teach, how they would like to convey it to you. Um, and especially in research, you know, it really helps you stand out that you are, you know, you're the face of it, right? You know, you can convey it how you want. And typically, it's something you can be very proud of. Uh, and obviously, with your with what you've just published, or you're working on publishing, you know, you have that sense of pride, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, when you when you're presenting something that everyone else has done, right? Everyone's done their first hello world, everyone's, you know, made certain functions or use object oriented programming. But, you know, when you use all these applications, you've picked up in school and put it all together, you know, you really just feel rewarded, you know. So, so you've, you've received quite a few honors and um, fellowships and awards through in your, you know, in your, your academic process journey here. Mm -hmm. um, at, and at a very young age as well. Um, what are your what would be your tips um, to an undergraduate student who is looking um, to pursue that? What, what would be your tips for that? Okay. Uh, so with respect to how I'm going to answer this question, it could be broad for anyone in academia or computer science in general, but uh, I'll focus on Ontario Tech in particular, uh, but it could be broad for anyone. Um, so the tips I have is at the very start of your education, first year, second year coming on the start of your third year got to get good grades you got to you know you got to show up to lectures you got to learn and get everything you can at the start and also make a name for yourself you know if that could just be answering questions you know having a short discussion with the professor after the lecture and just getting to know getting your name out there so that when you apply for these fellowships these grants you know who's reading it it's not these administrative people it's the professors, the professors that want you are reading your application. And if they if they read your name and they're like, well, I, I don't know who that is. I can't put a, a face to the name. Then it's a lot. It's a lot more challenging. And especially with COVID right now, it, it is it is difficult for the younger the younger audience right now. Uh, first and second years, it's tough because, you know, you're you're not in lecture, you're not in person. Um, and it, it is challenging. But, you know, you can still do it through mediums like email and Slack just to kind of get the wheels rolling. Um, when it comes to Even getting office follow hours, eh? Yeah, I found office that really hours useful. for sure. Yeah, and it, it's it's a nice way to get that one on one because that's something that is very. It's kind of lackluster in a lecture in the sense that, you know, I can answer every question if I want to. Right. But, you know, when you really get that one on one, you can get a bit more personal with the, the professor. Right. You can hear what they're interested in obviously you know not every professor loves every course they teach um they they obviously know all the content about it they can teach it very well but they may specialize in one particular niche and one thing when it comes to research is you need to find your niche that's the hardest part you know um you know are you interested you could say i'm interested in in data structures i'm interested in machine learning but these are quite, or algorithms in particular, um, these are very umbrella terms in the sense that, you know, they can hold a lot of niches. So you kind of need to trickle down and find where you're interested in. You know, you might be interested in web development, but 
what side of web development are you interested in? Are you interested in, you know, making forms and, and uh, fast processing databases within your web app? You know, there's a lot of tiny little things that you need to really be passionate about um, to kind of find which professor could match your needs. And I know me and you had this discussion uh, a few days ago offline talking about, you know, finding that professor in our university that could really be a fit for you. And typically sometimes it is nice to talk to, you know, someone like myself that has been through the, been through kind of the gauntlet of, you know, meeting the professors, finding out what they do. And, uh, you know, if you kind of show an older, you know, you could reach out to older grad students and say, well, what do you think? Um, I have these ideas. Do you think it could fit with your supervisor? Um, mm -hmm. But when it comes to actually getting the money, getting the grants, getting, you know, that position, you have to be strong at writing and you have to be confident in what you're writing, you know, because typically when you write your proposal, you may not even actually do that research. The supervisor might say, okay, perfect. I know that you have a great idea and you can incubate an idea, but I have this really cool proposal. Would you be interested in this? And typically when you do summer and circs, so that's what it is. It's a undergraduate student research assistant or something like that. I think that's, it's a USRS. That's what I've gotten. You can see it on my uh, portfolio. Uh, typically they have a proposal already and you just need to kind of show, you know, have some proposal ideas, have some um, repertoire that can kind of fit it. And the next step would just be to reach out to the supervisor, you know, say, Hey, could we have not with your course, but could I have a one-on-one -on -one with you? Let's just chat. And typically a lot of these professors are very interested in having skunk works in the sense that, it's something kind of just on the side, you're doing a small little project and you know, it can really get that relationship going. And that's the most important part, building these relationships uh, with your, your potential future supervisor. I think one thing that I found that's interesting is how oddly approachable the professors are. Like, you know, you when, especially, cause I mean, my podcast, not only is it geared towards, you know, younger undergraduate students or just getting started like myself, but also towards, you know, um, later high school um, students. And so who are still interested in this in going into research, perhaps they just graduated this this summer, right, that kind of thing. Um, and so it's interesting, because when you when you leave high school, they give you this sort of mentality, at least they gave it to me that, you know, you go, you're going to go to university and the profs aren't going to care and they aren't going to have time to talk to you. And, you know, it's this sort of like, you're, you're just a, really... a number, right? Is that, I think exactly. that's what every high school, year, you're just a number, but you're not a number, you know, especially yeah. in universities that have a smaller class size, it's a lot easier to not just be a number, right? You're a well, lot of the, a lot of the professors know you by name, right? Mm -hmm. Well, well, by default, you're a number, right? In, in some of those big classes, but that doesn't mean that it has to stay that way right it's 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 interesting because i i know i remember talking to one of my my high school teachers about university and that and him telling me his advice was um you know then he's like you have an awesome personality and they're gonna love you but hold off because they they aren't gonna like you right away um don't go on like don't go too hard right the, the, they're going to be in a class of 200 people and they're not going to care. Right. And I've actually found it to be the opposite of that. I found it to be like, you know, if you, especially in these times of COVID, like if you're able to effectively communicate, like not just pester, but effectively communicate. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so effectively communicating means, you know, reading their research. Right. It means having an interest in what they're interested in. It's almost like, developing any sort of like, you know, friendship relationship. It's the same idea, right? Yeah. They're, they're, I extent. think, I think that's one thing that, I mean, it's not like some people might be like, it's creepy. It's not, it, it's actually quite inspiring for the, like think, think, put, put yourself in the professor's shoes. Imagine you've been in academia for so long. You put your blood, sweat and tears into this paper, into this work. And then some young student read it, even if it was 10, 15, like, 10, 15 years ago, I think of uh, my supervisor, Fazl, I'm pretty sure when I was like in diapers, he was doing his PhD. I'm not trying to say he's old and Fazl, if, you, uh, if you're watching this, I'm not saying you're old, you're a young guy. <laughs> but, uh, but in particular, like the research is old in the sense, but you can also see 
you know, where, where they are today. You can kind of read through their, their citations and see how their work has developed over the years. And you can kind of pick up on what they're interested in. And you're totally right in the sense to do your homework. Um, especially you don't, you don't just reach out to a professor and say, Hey, let's chat. Right. It's nice to kind of go in with a discussion, um, especially with research meetings or office hours. You're not going to go in there and just be like, I have a textbook. You know, you're going to go in and you want to lead the discussion. You don't want them just to be like, okay, well, why are you here? You know, like, <laughs> well, what, what do you want? Right. You want, you want to go there and, and, you know, have something to talk about. You want a talking point and you're totally right. Um, to kind of summarize your words there to do your homework. Exactly. Exactly. So let's move on um, to understanding gene map. Actually, no, we're going to start from, we're going to go chronologically through your paper. So let's start okay. with, um, uh, what was the title of your, your first, um, your first research? So my first research path was with retention viz. And what that was is, we were we were I was working with Dr. Christopher Collins uh, under Via Lab, so it's the visual uh, the uh, information visualization lab, and I worked with him for about a year and a half. And uh, the title of the poster was Retention Viz. So the the whole point of this research was the registrar's office came to my supervisor uh, with the question, "Why are students dropping out? Right? Why?" and we were given a very, very large corpus of data, uh, which was obviously confidential. Uh, and it had to be that I could only uh, process the data. So obviously, it was all anonymized. Uh, names were removed, student numbers were removed, everything was anonymized, I, like you couldn't trace who someone was. But we were given the data of every student that has ever been to the university, their grades, what, court, what section they took, what supervisor taught, what, what professor taught that course. And we were given this massive corpus of data. And what we tried to do is we tried to make a web page, very simple, but mm -hmm. someone was able to click and play around with it to find you know, potential alleyways to say, well, why are all these students doing bad in this course? And they were able to kind of you know, click and mess around with the widgets to filter down from a massive amount of students, you could filter them by year, their GPA, uh, what time they took a course. And it was finally able to trickle down to a small sample of students. And you're able to look at what courses they took and what grades they got. So you could kind of analyze, the registrar's office could analyze kind of what's happening over the years through um, education. So for example, everyone apparently doesn't do good in like calculus or or physics in year one, a lot of science and technology students have to take that. Um, and we were able to kind of figure out why, uh, why if they were poor in calculus, it could have led to them doing poor in you know, linear algebra or discrete mathematics. And we can kind of find out that's where the problem is, that people mm -hmm. aren't doing good in calculus. So how can we fix that? So, so did you find any, I'm, see, I'm, I'm starting to, to, I guess tie this into some of my own research right now. Mm -hmm. um, did you find any any trends, any unexpected trends, or were were you solely looking for, like, for example, I guess a class bottleneck, course bottleneck? Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Um, so how this actually worked, how this tool worked, um, it's so much better to explain when I have it in front of me. Uh, but it's mm -hmm. an exploratory data analysis tool. So what that means is I don't give you the answers. I give you the canvas and you're able to mess around with it to find what you're interested in. So Makes sense. it's not just computer science. It would be every faculty, every program, every student, mm -hmm. all of their information, all of their course information, but all the, obviously it was all anonymous, but they were able to, you know, maybe they're saying, well, let's look into social science today. Let's look into criminology. Let's trickle down and try to find some potential problem areas. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look on my website uh, under that publication in the poster, I do have some visualizations there that can, you know, maybe make a little bit more sense of what I'm alluding to here. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so we weren't actually, we didn't actually publish any trends. We simply developed a tool for the university to use. 
in that. Makes sense. sense. So it was a that makes massive sense. script of web app development and uh, using like JavaScript and stuff like that. Totally out of my comfort zone, but it worked. <laughs> hey, that's cool. As long as it works, right? So I've, yeah, the, the, the reason that I brought that up is because I'm currently um, doing some research into a similar type of a thing. So it's into, I, I guess, instead of grades specifically, it's looking at, um, at, I guess, overall success or success in creating a, like a, 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 a how do you phrase it? I guess a psychological success, a sense of accomplishment, right? Okay. Um, at the end of a term, sense of personal development. Um, and so what we're doing is we're working with, um, we're, we're gonna be developing a tool. Um, I'm not gonna go into too many details, but developing a tool to um, provide these, uh, provide some uh, first year psychology students at U of T. Um, we've got some U of T profs who are willing to work with us and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, it's interesting to see we're, we're, I guess we're trying to find a trend between, um, being able to, I guess, confidence in, in specific sources, being able to validate sources through computational means, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like, you know, like a, a traditional, I guess, peer review type of a situation, um, whatever it may, or like an, an impact score of a journal, right. Instead of going that direction, going more of a computational direction, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah. And then seeing if that is effective, but I, I think that, I, th sorry, that was a, a bit of a sidebar. But um, oh, the pro the problem the problem with a lot of these these avenues of research is just the accessibility of data. And you know, yeah. with, with comp computer science and the and using trends and you know trying to apply algorithms to finding a solution, typically the limitation even in machine learning, deep learning is do we have the data to do it? Um, mm -hmm. And that can kind of lead into some of the research that I did a little bit later um, in my academic academic career. That you know the limitation typically sometimes is data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. So, so in terms of um, in terms of that tool, um, uh, my audience isn't entirely computer science, so mm -hmm. it might not be ideal if we went too far into it. But if you want to summarize briefly some of the some of the, I guess, actually, you know, perhaps a good way to do it without getting too far into that is to, for me to ask you a broader question along the lines of what sorts of resources did you need to, or how did you come up with the resources that you needed to okay. do the research, if that makes any sense? Okay. So this research was continued from a previous uh, uh, recipient of a, of a like fellowship. So mm -hmm. I inherited a, a base of code, which I ha first had to optimize. Uh, but where we started was we were given a massive JSON. So that's simply just a way to format data um, of all the information of the students. And we needed to load that into our web page. And at that point, we used JavaScript for the computer science people in the room. Uh, we use JavaScript to use D3.js, which is a visualization tool. So we can customly make we can custom make visualizations. So we made a bunch of custom visualizations that would work for what we needed. So what we actually did was prior to actually coding it, we sat there for for weeks doing sketches. So I believe I might be wrong, but I believe it's called a 10 by 10. I, um, it's been a while. Um, it's a 10 by 10. And what that means is prior to actually making something on the web page, we had to propose 10 ideas to how to convey that, that data and then 10 ways for each of those. So it, this is how it kind of goes all over, 10 by 10. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's 10 sketches of different ways we can do it. And there's 10 ways for each of those ways that how we can show it. Okay. So for example, I could have a bar chart, but how can I show this bar chart? Um, you know, not just like vertically or horizontally, I'm speaking like, is there other ways like using dots or using um, a growing uh, bar, like a bar that comes out in, you know, kind of like a cylindrical way? Or is mm -hmm. there a better way to show, you know, using a bar chart, you put humans or something like that, you know, it's different mm -hmm. ways that you can convey that visualization that might help the, re the other audience or the users have a better experience. I know that yeah. at, at one point in time, I was doing some research into 
um, carbon pricing efficacy. And I think a similar type of an approach um, was taken there in terms of the use of color, the okay. use of, we had a scatter plot and the use of the color of the dots was very helpful to be able to, um, to illustrate almost like a 3D trend, but also, um, also just in 2D, because sometimes 3D is a little bit difficult to see, right? Yeah. It's a but, headache sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as nice it is, as cool as it is to be able to open up your, you know, your 3D plot and spin around, I mean, it's kind of hard to put that in a paper, so. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's something that you have to be very careful about with uh, publications that, you know, you need to be able to show your, your, your work, right? And sometimes you have to make compromises in your papers to show something. Like, I would love to put a massive full page of an image, but that takes up a full page if I'm um, page count limited, right? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you can't just throw images or massive, you know, visualizations on a paper due to limitation of, of space, right? You can't, For even sure. if append there's appendixes, you know, you, you don't want to say, well, go look at the appendix every page, you know, it's, mm -hmm. then it just becomes like a burden for the editor, right? Of course, <laughs> exactly. So you said you worked with a, um, a team on this. Yeah. What, uh, I think we talked about this a little bit. What, um, how, how do you, I guess a, a few questions on that, because this is your only paper that you've worked um, in like a group of researchers. Right. Um, what, I guess my questions would be, I guess let's, let's start with um, how did you find these people? Like were these people who were already working on the project, like you said, it's, it was inherited or is it more of a, um, did you seek these people out or a mixture of both? Yeah, so to keep this short, um, so the team was uh, Christopher Collins, Dr. Christopher Collins, who was the, the supervisor. We also had a, a doctoral fellow, which is a postdoc uh, researcher in the lab, Adam Bradley. Um, and then we had Riley, who was, it was, so she was the master's student of the project, me being a bachelor's as fellow. Her, it was technically her research, but she was looking into different avenues. So she was looking into what you brought up pr prior, the trends in the machine learning, but they still wanted that web application and Riley didn't want to spend all of her time on it. So mm -hmm. I was kind of at the bottom being kind of like the developer, right? So I, I had to go and co collaborate with my higher ups. I would go and show them sketches. We would discuss kind of what I was working on each week. And uh, this team was all from my lab. And, you know, we're literally sitting right beside each other. So, you know, collaboration was great in the sense that, you know, we were able to, you know, I pull my chair back, say, hey, can you give this a quick look? Like, what do you think? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was all from the lab. Makes sense. Makes sense. So um, I guess, generally speaking, how do you find, what, what is your advice to students or to, to potential undergraduate researchers mm -hmm. um, looking to find people to to do research with um, do you do you, I guess um, perhaps a, a question to to extend on that is do you think that it's better to stay within your faculty within your connections or do you think it's better to broaden go interdisciplinary so I, I kind of again I'm kind of biased on this in the sense of speaking as a computer scientist as a computer scientist, it, it is very challenging to go interdisciplinary because mm -hmm. especially when you want to do something that's tech, it's hard to because then you're putting a lot more of a stress on these these outer source people. Um, and I have a perfect mm -hmm. example of that, uh, that we went interdisciplinary in my uh, field and in, in one of my projects. We can maybe get into that later if you want, or I can talk mm -hmm. about it uh, now. But anyways, I um, think problem with interdisciplinary is it's, again... If you have the need for like a business side or um, a, a researcher that you don't, maybe I don't know anything about chemistry and we want to do something with computer science and chemistry, it's good to have those those out of out of university or um, out of source kind of resources that you can say, well, hey, I have a question about this. How can I tie this in? Uh, when it comes to getting to meet people um, within the university to get to, you know, get find research partners. If you want someone in your cohort, you know, typically those are your friends or people who, you know, you can just kind of mingle around at lectures or, you know, kind of put out a, a group message saying, is anyone interested in this? Kind of start a discussion. Uh, in my experience, uh, typically um, when I got into research, it, 
in VC lab with Fazil after the Christopher Collins project, which I just talked about, um, I, we kind of just went through all of our masters and PhD students. So I was always kind of one of the seniors. Um, mm -hmm. So speaking on the senior sense, not being like obviously my supervisor, but I had many uh, third and fourth year students come up to me in my TA time or I'm TAing or I'm walking around upstairs. And this is something that everyone who work, who goes, is going to go to Ontario Tech uh, and any other university for that means is you typically have a spot. So all computer science profs are in a certain spot or building. And typically you'll find the master's students lingering around there too. You get to see them and see them, see them. So I started to have students approach me and say, well, what do you do? Um, you know, so I say, oh, come into the lab. I'll show you what I do. I'll introduce you to a couple other of the people in the lab. Sometimes they're actually people in your cohort that are also doing research, right? Mm -hmm. um, and being kind of a, a senior of my lab, uh, kind of someone that people can, you know, ask questions to is my younger uh, researchers, you know, if they have any questions, they come and ask me, um, you know, mm -hmm. Google is great to answer questions. But if you have someone who is a senior of you or someone whose expertise is closer to something, come and ask them because they probably exactly. already dealt with that problem. Yeah. So I feel like um, anyone who's, who's done programming um, either really, really likes, although I don't think it's that often or, despises stack overflow for that similar right. reason right that there's yeah. it's this sort of like you know weird weird online place i guess you could say yeah <laughs> so in terms of um we should move on to perhaps your two video analysis papers so that's exploring lstms for video analysis and content aware video summarization okay. it before we, we get onto that, do you think that it's fair for me to sort of group them together? Is, is yeah. that a, yeah? yeah. To totally, yeah. So these, okay. so the first one, which is the one that's really blue, the poster, if you're looking at the posters or if anyone's listening to the podcast and looks me up, uh, that was my, my summer research. And what we did was I used my summer research to kind of piggyback my honors thesis. So um, exploring, video summarization using LSTMs. I forget exactly what the title is right now. I'm all, all, all over the place. Uh, but the, the latter of the two was my honors thesis. So at the very end of your honors thesis, you publish a paper and also you have your thesis, you know, your, your document. I'm, I don't think that's published on my website. Uh, but you, I don't know if you want to go through all that. It's long. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. But the posters are good because they're very they're to the point. Um, they are very but, to the point. I've been doing a lot of like with all my podcasts, pretty much nobody has those types of posters, at least publicly available. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it, it's a little tough trying to read those, you know, and I mean, I was having a conversation this morning um, with a future guest on the show about how difficult it is for undergraduate students to read like a 30, 40 page manuscript, right? Like it's not, mm -hmm. it's not easy and to be able to critically assess it, right? It's definitely a challenge and that's part of the reason for the podcast right yeah, yeah. so um, coming coming from someone who's done years of research reading papers or citations takes years of experience you can't just just it's, it's a whole methodology you can't just read a paper and you're an expert sometimes i take three passes through a paper you know i skim through it and then i do a full read and then i go back and read it again to tie in things that i learned you know, mm -hmm. it just takes that. Sorry, sorry, a little bit off topic, but that's something that takes a long time to master. Um, man, you, I, I still even struggle with some papers, and I've been doing computer vision in particular for years now. And it's, sometimes I read it and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, uh oh, <laughs> that's not good. So, so let's um, let's. I'd love to hear a summary of the. This guy, the content aware video summarization, the, the blue okay. one, if you want yeah. to uh, provide that quickly, that'd be awesome. So so I can kind of mesh them together um, in yep. the sense that they are somewhat similar. Uh, sure, but what we that. tried to do is uh, a previous researcher, uh, Wesley Taylor, uh, in the lab came up with this solution for video summarization on commodity hardware. So it worked on laptops. So we were saying, well, what if we want to bypass the commodity hardware and use real tech? 
use big big supercomputers and stuff like that to process. Again, these are expensive machines, so commodity hardware seems like a more viable solution. But yet, it is good in case you need something in a larger scale, you know, for you know a video, a full video, or sports or something like that. Uh, so what we tried to do is we tried to use the power of of long short term memory cells to assist a full stack of video summarization tools. So that looks at each frame of a video one at a time, determines if it's visually appealing. Then we look at how we can actually smooth out the, the video. And then we then rank using long short-term memory cells, how important each of these frames are to add it into a shortened summarization. So for example, having a 20 minute video down to you know three minutes, similar to like a trailer for example, mm -hmm. but not as crazy. <laughs> that makes sense. So in terms of, um, I guess, a question that I would have, again, I, I like connecting back to my research. Mm -hmm. uh, my research was done on, my plebeian algorithm paper was done on um, the spread of misinformation using sentiment analysis. Okay. How, like, do, does your paper, first off, does your paper already address that sentiment analysis, or could that be easily embedded? Would that be a future area of, of research, is I guess what I'm getting at, so, in order to, say, analyze, like, a YouTube video for misinformation? Yes. Okay, so being, so this is one thing when it comes to undergraduate research, is that typically you don't have enough time to go through the full scope, right? Mm -hmm. So I typically consider undergraduate research and um, honors thesis to be exploring and learning how to be a researcher. You do typically have a big project, but the biggest takeaway, and I tell all of my uh, younger students in my labs that you're doing this to yes, get a project, but you are becoming a stronger researcher and a stronger computer scientist. Um, mm. When it comes to sentiment analysis, we were simply looking, we weren't looking at the interior of what's happening in the paper in the sense of using um, like action recognition or something like that. We did use an object detection network to see if there were objects in the image. So typically through a, a movie, if there are apparent objects in the image or a lot of objects, then we could potentially use that to higher rank a frame. Uh, so each, each frame was processed. We looked at what sentiments, as you would refer to it as, or objects in the image to help teach the LSTM that potentially this frame was better. And we were able to validate that because in the data set that we were using, they had importance frame rankings for each frame. So we had to, we were able to validate that and then evaluate it on a different set. Makes sense. That makes sense. So because I know we're, we're getting close to time here, why don't we move on to, um, the gene map models paper. Sure. Um, so this is a really cool paper. Why don't we start mm -hmm. by talking about describing to, I guess, the non-biologically minded people, uh -huh. AKA myself, um, about what exactly a gene map, sorry, gene model map is. Um, okay. And yeah, and then I guess perhaps if you could bring it up to what the, the problem or the research question is in mind. Okay, so this is an interdisciplinary uh, research uh, project. So this is my master's studies. Um, as of right now, we are we're currently in August. So I'm looking for a finishing date around September, maybe potentially the end of August. So I'm almost done. Um, due to, to confidentiality, I can't talk about certain things, but we can definitely dive into it high level. So first question is, what is a gene model map? And yeah, you know, knowing that a lot of people aren't strong in biology, I'll tell you straight up as well, I'm not good at biology. I'm a computer scientist, right? I, and when I first got tasked with this uh, project, I was like, well, I don't know anything about biology. What am I going to do, right? But when you start to look at interdisciplinary tasks with computer science, it doesn't take much domain knowledge in your interdisciplinary or uh, other association or in the sense bioinformatics or uh, genome genome studies um, mm. to do a solution. You just kind of need a certain questions answered. Uh, so what is a gene model map? A gene model map is what we deem a biological diagram that has inherent understanding. 
So within citations in bioinformatics and genomics, if I pronounce that correctly, there are how typically these researchers convey their contributions is through an image. So yes, they have this massive paper discussing all the, the little details, but what they typically do is they use an image or multiple images within the paper to show how this discovery in biology fits into the grand scheme of things. So what we name these or title them in our paper and in my work is gene model maps. So uh, genetic model maps, gene model maps, we like to keep it simple, or I refer to them as GMMs or blobs in, in other uh, other alleyways. Uh, I don't know, I call them blobs, <laughs> but yes, yeah, but a blob is, with, is a gene within the gene model map. So that would be one inherent gene within the grand scheme of things. So we use a simple image. And what we're trying to do here, and maybe you can lead up with a follow-up question, is we're collected, we collected from PubMed thousands and hundreds of thousands of these images. We then needed to determine out of all of these citations images, which are gene model maps. And we're now at the point where we have these all of these biological diagrams. Now the question is, what do we do with them? Yeah. So so yes, you have all these these things. We're trying to I guess you're you're essentially trying to automate the interpretation of it. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah. So the there was a white paper. So I'm working with Dr. Nicholas Provart from the Cells and Systems Biology Lab at U of T. And then I also have Dr. Fazel Kreshi, who's my supervisor. So we're working with uh him and some of his students to now try to task this problem of so. Currently in the works, there is tools that using text, you can search up a particular gene and it gives you a description, right? Okay. But we're interested in, well, what if we can just grab images from the papers and tell you what's happening in the paper? We could tell you and give you a summarization. So in an elevator pitch, what we're trying to do is for every paper, we want to have all the images from that paper that are a gene model map and give you a textual description of what relationships are present. So what that Makes can sense. do is accelerate finding related works and related fields by you know a factor of 10. We don't know. We haven't tested actually quali qualitatively how long it takes, but we're really hoping that we can evolve what people know of as their search space. Instead of just Googling, give me, so I'm gonna get a little bit biology here, but this is a very widely used gene, ABI3, and it's very it's it's visible everywhere. ABI3. So instead of Googling ABI3 and getting papers about it, it would not only give you papers about ABI3, but within papers of ABI3, it would give you other citations that use ABI3 in connection to another gene. So similar, an A to B situation. Makes sense. And I think that was one of the the way you described it in your um how do you call it in your your poster um yeah. was like such that a relationship b right yeah. um which is it's kind of weird to read it but then it, it took me a second to like i had to say it out loud a relationship b right mm -hmm. sort of like an operator to some extent um so so yeah so i guess um so, so you develop this tool, mm -hmm. um, or you are developing this tool. Um, how how did you? Th this is a big problem, right? Like, and you're saying it's not very. You're not particularly biologically minded. Mm -hmm. um, how did you go about tackling this difficult of a of a um, an issue, if that makes any sense, of a topic? Uh, okay. So, being a computer vision and deep learning practitioner obviously I work with, you know, deep neural networks and I am well fond of, you know, coding in, for example, PyTorch. Um, but now being introduced into biology, when it comes to computer vision in general, everyone uses natural images. So all around the world, you've probably seen many of them, even Googling, seeing object detection and stuff like that. There is a wide collection of data sets and all of these use natural images, but where this research is very powerful is we're diving into a new area that doesn't use natural images. So a natural image could just be a picture of someone rowing a boat, 
right? That's a natural image. It's something that has one particular action associated with it, some objects associated with it. And what we're actually looking at now is visual illustrations. So we're now introducing and opening a new avenue of computer vision, uh, the first of its kind to develop the next generation of bioinformatics tools. Uh, so where we had to start from the ground up is to do some sort of deep learning task, we need data. So what we had to do is we, uh, with my collaborator at U of T, we created a uh, data scraper. So we scraped from PubMed one particular gene, Arabidopsis thaliana. I've had to practice pronouncing it a thousand times, but it's the most widely researched uh, geno genome or gene. It's one plant. Basically, basically, it's a corn plant, and everyone uses it because it's easy to extract something from it. I have no idea. Uh, all I know is there's a lot of papers on it. There was like 200,000 papers. So we scraped all of the images and we then said, okay, well now we need a data set, right? So we went through it by hand, all these images. Well, we went through um, about eight, uh, maybe 8,000 images, one at a time, clicking through them to say, is it a gene model map visually or not? So we had to do it manually by hand to create this first generation of data. Uh, so first we simply just said, is it a model or is it not a model? And then at that point we could train a network, a neural network to say, well, is it a network? Uh, is it a model map or is it not? So then we could rapidly grow using a neural network that's trained our data set. So we grew this data set, grew it, grew it, grew it. And we came to this next problem where we don't have any annotations. So an annotation would be, you have an image and you need bounding boxes, you need validation to say, this is a dog, this is a cat, and it's right in, right here in the image. So, you know, I have a piece of paper, right? Like that. I have a box here, I have a box there, and so on. So I have ground truth is what you refer to it. So our problem was we don't have any ground truth. So we had to create synthetic data sets, which try to replicate what biological diagrams look like but we can automatically generate them using a computer. Okay. Um, yeah. So that makes that's sense. how we that's how we got the wheels rolling. We needed the data to start training neural networks. So first we needed to validate that something is a gene model map. We realized, well, we don't have any ground truth and it's very expensive to get ground truth or to pay people to do it. So we said, well, why don't we just make it ourselves? So the next step would be we need to train object detection networks to identify parts within these diagrams because you know if they're trained on natural images by default they're not going to know what to do with an arrow or you know a, t a, a gene they're not going to be able to identify that so we had to train that and the next step would be how can we actually get this textual output and that's the fun part <laughs> so just in the in like if, if i'm following this um poster that would take us through, was it gene net sin? Is that how you sign? Yeah, so gene net synthetic. Um, it's just a short form. So that's our gene net synthetic di diagram data set, which is an evolutionary data set that um, increases in difficulty and complexity. And we automatically created these images. Um, so first we started with random generation, and then we looked at more of a grid-like generation so that you know, diagrams don't have overlaps and stuff like that. So we looked at how can we actually spread out what we refer to as blobs, but genes in the image so that there are no overlaps and it looks like a publisher did create it. Makes sense. So, so I guess um, before we move on, because um, I would like to get you to talk a little bit about um, getting how, how you derived those um, I guess went from the the image to the text. Um, that could be interesting. But before we move on to that, um, how my, my my thoughts my thoughts on this in terms of future areas of research would be, and I don't know if if you have any thoughts on this, or if this is a thing that already exists or what. But um, to have something along the lines of like I know when I'm doing data analysis, and I have you know I pop up graphs, and I have all these graphs, and I'm um, I usually, what I do is I just generate a ton of graphs about, you know, every different possible, you know, thing that I can think, oh yeah, this might be interesting to see, right? Yeah. And then I look at them and I sit there for hours and I think about, okay, what does this mean, right? Like I see a, you know, 
um, for example, for carbon emissions, um, certain countries you see their carbon emissions rise over time and then they drop linearly, right? Mm -hmm. um, you see for some countries, they almost seem to be parabolic to some extent and then they drop at a certain point, right? Yeah. Some countries are just straight lines up, which is, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, Iran, uh, not good. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like as you look through them, it's interesting, but um, the thought that I would have would be, is there a, a similar, like you're saying, we're looking at not like natural images, but more of a, um, more of a, I guess, a derived image, if that makes any sense. I don't uh, know what the word is. A visual illustration. Um, visual so, illustration. So you can think of those. So uh, other related works looked into like the water cycle, for example. So scientific diagrams, like, so the, my related works, which I an, inspired this work, looked at grade school scientific diagrams and it did question and answering for these diagrams. Okay. So we're looking at, okay, grade school, it's amazing work, very complicated work, but we want to take it to the next level and look at, you know, post-secondary diagrams that are very complex, hard to understand. Um, I don't understand any of them. You know, it's, it's very, very complex. And we're looking at simply biology. So right now, this is a, a niche idea, right? So we're looking at just bioinformatics, just one particular gene. But mm -hmm. where this, so I see what you're trying to say. Where is this going to go? Where do mm -hmm. I see it going? Um, like I guess what I would what I would think is would it be possible to have um, a computer vision system similar to what you've done um, spit out if you want to call it that um, <laughs> a, a basically an analysis of of what all these graphs mean it's like hey so I have this three D plot what does it mean right like what is the what is the general correlation in like human words so that you can look at it and say oh yeah carbon is doing this something happens carbon's changing right so um okay um so that's that's something that i think in the next 10 15 years hmm. we're gonna get to that point of artificial intelligence i don't like using that word but as an umbrella yeah. i think artificial intelligence in the sense of question and answering like siri or or google you know giving you that that deeper understanding I think we're getting to that point where we can start to process uh, higher concepts. Uh, but again, you still need to train these systems. They, mm -hmm. they don't just learn from nothing. They, they need something to piggyback to, tr to get smarter and smarter, right? So that's why we need to train our networks because by default, they're not going to do anything, right? So we need to train mm -hmm. it, train it, train it to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So with regards to my research in particular, where I could see this going is right now, we have the single avenue of one gene and we have this massive corpus of papers, right? Like 250,000 papers, whatever, a ton of papers. But if the crazy man in me says, if I really wanted to take this to the next level, instead of just this one little niche in bioinformatics, we could open it up to all of biology. We could open it up to all of chemistry. We could look at, um, you know, for example, everyone did organic chemistry in high school. Imagine if you could just look at an organic chemistry diagram and it could just reprocess it. Like you could draw it by hand and send it to a system and it tells you, you know, this is connected to this, this is connected to this, this probably is this organic compound, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, and this is going to take a ton of work, right? Um, but if I really wanted to go down the entrepreneurial route and, you know, really own this project it could expand uh these are kind of setting up the baselines so typically mm -hmm. in research when you open a new avenue of, of work which is what we're doing is we need baselines we need to show people these are the data sets we have this is the work we did these are the results and people mm -hmm. if they're interested will begin to evolve it so it's again this this growth so if people are interested you know they might take my system and make it even better and again, that's something I'm proud of because, you know, I kind of set up the, the like paved the cement and now it can continue to grow. So that's something we're really hoping uh, future forward, uh, hopefully to get a good conference paper in and maybe inspire uh, computer vision practitioners to expand this area of work. And at the end of the day, it's not only evolving computer vision and machine learning, but it's also in the second, like kind of behind is really helping these bioinformatics researchers, because think about finding a paper that's related to you. 
Sometimes it takes hours. Sometimes you don't even find one. But what mm -hmm. if we had a system on top of PubMed that you could search not only by title, but relationships or compounds within these papers? It's taking search querying to the next level. Yeah, that's that's pretty, I think that's a good, I feel like that's a good wrapping point at this point in the paper because I think we're probably getting close on time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have a question and it's, I think this might be a good kind of summary question, wrapping up question is a, a final thing here. Um, What's your favorite programming language? I know it's a terrible question to ask a computer yeah. scientist, but let's let's see. Uh, so when I first began computer science, I started in Turing, if anyone's ever heard of that. It's very, it's just like Lego. Um, there's another name for it now, now that's newer, uh, but it's basically like taking Lego pieces and putting them together. It's Scratch, I believe. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, but my so. favorite programming language is Python. Um, Python, I find, in my personal opinion, is the easiest programming language to not only learn, but develop. So the nice thing about Python is from introductions all the way until you are at my level, there are libraries and packages which fit your needs. You need a web application, got it. You need deep learning, got it. You need video processing or image processing, got it. It's all. It's got a lot of libraries and it's very easy to develop libraries uh, to fit your needs. Um, and the nice thing is about Python, you just have to press play. I don't need to compile anything. I just need to make sure my code is functionally fine and then I can see results right, at, right in front of me. Uh, so I've been so, doing Python for like 10 years. Uh, so I'm, I, am, uh, I still use it to this day. Yeah, I just, oddly enough, people, like when I was in high school, people were like, oh, you got to learn Python. You got to learn Python. And I was like, I'm fine with Java. Java's fine. I like yeah. the syntax. And then it was just like, I got taught Python in first year undergrad. And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't like Java. I like Python. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. for like, it, like, uh, this is one thing I like to do, especially as a teaching assistant or an instructor is I like to put a very simple program of like, Python and like Java mm -hmm. side by side. And obviously, mm -hmm. at, through your education, you need to learn them, you need to learn Java, yeah. you need to learn C++. But it's cool to show people. Yeah, it's like Java ha and C++ have their their positives, they definitely do. But for mm -hmm. most needs most air quotes, most needs, I put them side by side and say, this is a for loop or whatever, a function in, in Python. And this is a function in Java, which one would you rather code? Um, yeah. Especially when it comes to like tests and examinations, it's good to code in Python because it's so fast. Um, mm -hmm. And syntax is quite simple. I don't have to worry about brackets. I don't have to worry about semicolons. I don't have to worry about uh, memory analysis and putting things in particular spots. It's just uh, a breath of fresh air. Um, and that's for sure. And it's in demand. Uh, you know, it's I've looked at a thousand job postings and a lot of them say you need to know ja uh, not Java. You need to know Python. <laughs> the reason why uh, young folk, young computer scientists like Java so much is because that's what they learn first. Yeah, it's, it's all you know, right? Like if I have only played baseball, I am like baseball. But if I play hockey, I might like that, too. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. kind of you get to be shown things. Yeah. And why do you think it is that that many, um, say, high school students get taught on Java? Is do you think that's just ancient curriculum or curricula? Do you think it's just um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah? It's uh, it's so you gotta think like I don't I'm not bashing on high schools, but high, like you yeah. think of a high school high school curriculum. It's 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 typically always the same. Computer science is one thing I feel needs to be evolved in in curriculum uh, in especially grade 11 and grade 12, that Python should be the language you learn first, in my opinion, just because it's a lot more of a welcoming language. You know, you're not getting thrown all of these very complex uh, data structures and, you know, abstract functions and stuff like that. It's, it's very welcoming. Um, just to put it, give it an example, I've taught grade threes all the way from the basics to object-oriented programming in multiple weeks and they're still very strong at it. They can be independent. 
Um, I think it's a language, like if I look at a grade three and try to teach them Java or C++, it would be a lot more of a, a harder language to teach. Oh, for sure. And so it's kind of, kind of interesting because I know my computer science teacher in high school, who was, I guess, sort of my, my mentor, um, really, he, he really was against the, the fact that the curriculums were so old. He, um, according to him, and I mean, he did exaggerate quite a bit. So I mean, take it as you will. But um, according to him, the, the curriculum at Ontario curriculum, I believed was was last the last time it had an actual change was 99 yeah that sounds um, about right <laughs> and yeah and he says what they did is in 2014 they republished the same document but changed all the years to 2019 he says he went into the document control f replaced um all of 1990 or sorry all of 2014 to 1999 and then threw it into a t uh, comparison and they were identical <laughs> yeah. well yeah you gotta yeah. think of of uh, in, in academia, in particular high school, you got to think of it's hard to change, right? Because these mm. these these teachers they they teach the same curriculum year by year by year, and as the years go by, they're not aware of what's happening in the industry. That's the nice thing about university mm. that they have this industry feedback. They have researchers who are doing the cutting edge research, so they know what's best, and it kind of trickles mm. down from there. Um, I would really hope in the future that um, the curriculum is redone especially for high schools. But the problem is, is maybe these teachers don't know Python, yeah. right? And that, that's, that's a complication, right? Yeah, that's true. That yeah. is true. Well, on that point, is there anything else you wanted to add? Any last minute uh, advice for people or? I mean, I uh, just wanted to, you know, again, thank you for having me on the podcast. Hopefully um, any, uh, younger uh, university students or uh, younger cohort that are interested in computer science or uh, any field in particular, um, you know, hopefully I give them a little bit of inspiration that, you know, being, for example, me, um, and I'm very open about this is I never had the very highest grades. I never had the very highest GPA. But the one thing that made me stand out is my ambition to do things. I wanted to TA. I wanted to be a researcher. So what did I do? I kept knocking on doors and I kept asking people, what can I do? Can we work on something? And, you know, now I'm at the point where I have a lot of scholarships. I have a lot of uh, you know, prestigious awards that can show that, you know, I, I've, I've done it. Right. And, uh, you know, we're far from over. Um, so I just want to you know tell the younger audience that, you know, even if you think, you know, all oh, first year has been so bad, um, it's not over yet. Um, you have a long way to go. And, now's the time to keep keep driving because you know COVID's gonna be done soon you'll be back in the university well not done but hopefully we'll be back in the university soon and uh mm. you know you'll be back into that uh one-on-one -on -one and get that uh, personal touch and i hope to see you all around one day <laughs> <laughs> for sure well on that note thanks for um thanks for joining um that was pretty awesome and uh yeah thanks everyone for watching i'm gonna leave links to uh, Michael's personal website, LinkedIn, and then the four four uh, posters that we talked about um, just in the description there. Um, and as always, I'll leave my stuff down there if anyone wants to contact me. If you know anyone who's you know interested in chatting, drop me a line. Um, awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, you can cut that out.